Welcome to Trinity Radio. I'm Braxton Hunter, and over there is... Jonathan Pritchett. Are our mics pretty well the same? I have no idea, but... Look like they are. Looks the like fact are. that the, the little green line is mm -hmm. about even with you means hopefully fewer complaints about me. And I'll try not to do this the whole time. You know why I'm talking, so... So, um, just to make sure everyone loves us and isn't upset, we're going to take one question right off the top, and then we're going to get into the topic of the day. But ask your questions, put question in all caps, or I'll just try to find them. But if you do that, I'll definitely find them. Um, we, if people do give us super chats, we so appreciate that. And we go to those first. We appreciate that you've done that. Um, but we're going to do a topic today. A really exciting one, but yes. first, Dr. Jonathan Pritchett is going to answer the following question. I was like, hey, right off the bat, a good question. We don't get very many. No, I'm just kidding. We get uh, lots of good questions, but I actually like questions like this because it's an um, interesting question. It's it's gets us away from the usual, how do you respond to the atheist? So, best way to discern between being a stumbling block and enjoying Christian liberty. Now, I've said this repeatedly. You want to enjoy your Christian liberty, but not be a stumbling block to others. The internet, interestingly enough, makes this more complicated. I am an old-fashioned Baptist. I am one of those people who are slow. I don't criticize the big beer and Bible studies and the beer and Bible consortium, that sort of thing. I don't criticize it. I understand its mission aspects, but I'm one of those people because I, and, and I'm freely admit this is my Baptist programming that if your Christian liberty is something that makes other people uncomfortable, generally in culture, like Braxton and I are from the South, and the South has weird things about this. I'm of the opinion, can you not keep your liberty, your Christian liberty, as private as possible as opposed to just announcing your liberty and trying to rub it in the face of people who disagree with you on certain things? So alcohol is the obvious example. I already mentioned the beer. I, I, I don't see the point because to me, I didn't grow up in a Southern Baptist tradition. So when I came into the Southern Baptist tradition, the teetotaling thing was new to me. It was weird. I couldn't believe that people believed that for one thing, but for another, I didn't. I couldn't believe the Southern Baptists who didn't like the traditional view of that's all bad. I, I I didn't understand why they made a big thing of it. Like if you, I understand having the theoretical debate on the topic, but what I don't understand is trying to be as outspoken of an advocate by exercising your liberty in people's faces that make it uncomfortable. And yeah. I know that that sounds so, old fashioned. Let, let me, let me try to yeah, say but, what I think it's in, it's in concert with what you're saying, which is if person a comes to the con conclusion that it is biblically permissible for one to drink beverage alcohol on occasion, so long as one does not get drunk, if someone comes to such a conclusion well enough, if, if that's an issue of Christian conviction for them, but if they're visiting with people who um, don't feel that way, there's a different circumstance here. Well, if you might say, well, maybe he, this person should try to convince them otherwise. Well, there's all kinds of things to talk about there when it comes to substances, since you talked about substances yeah. like uh, addiction and, uh, and someone might be in recovery and all those kind of things. But there's another issue that just has to do with the spiritual, and that is this. If I think, Jonathan, here's the thing. It, it, my heart of rebellion toward God is the problem. And if I think uh, that engaging in, this, if I think that drinking beverage alcohol is a sin, however I came to, you know, however, whatever preacher convinced me of that, yeah. if I am now of the, under the persuasion that drinking beverage alcohol is a sin and I don't have to do it, and I decide, well, I don't care. I don't care what God says. Don't care what the preacher says. I'm going to drink this beverage alcohol, whatever, you know, yeah. and then they do that. I think that person is in sin, not necessarily because of the rightness or wrongness of that doctrinal position right. or that social position, but because the person had a heart of rebellion toward God about this. Yeah. Now, if they had searched the scriptures and came to this conclusion, that's a whole different thing. And so, um, so, so yeah, so that person for them, if they, if they're of the conviction that it's wrong, to drink beverage alcohol, but they do it anyway, and and and, and it would then it would be a sin for them to do it, right? 
And so if it's you're doing it, is yeah. it can cause a very real stumbling block in that way for sin, even if you don't think it is a sin. Yeah, you could actually be your own stumbling block mm-hmm. there. You are being yeah, your yeah. own stumbling block. Yeah. But but I do want to I do want to temper what I'm saying is because I heard some really dumb arguments. I think arguments that any sort of alcohol are 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 horrible. Go see Michael Jones on that. Um, but but I've also heard dumb arguments growing up that like. Well, somebody may know who you are and they see you minding your own business in the grocery store buying it or minding your own business. You're at a restaurant with your wife or whatever and y'all are having drinks or whatever and they see that and you didn't intend for them to mind your business for you. I I don't know. You're not being a stumbling block if you're minding your own business, even in public doing it. So when I when I say like public announcements or whatever, I'm not talking about just going about your life living it and not living in fear that someone somewhere may mind your business for you, see you do it. And then they end up doing something that's beyond your control. All right. All right. That, that, that stuff I don't think is, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay. Either, so so yeah. the topic of the day, now that we have burst forth with controversy, um, at least between the Christians is to say, folks, <laughs> we made it. We barely made it, but we made it. We made it. To 15,000. Yes. 15,000 subscribers on the YouTubes. Yes, and we've been doing this for five years, so that's an <laughs> average of 3,000 subscribers a year. Well, and 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 so I want to do talk It doesn't about, work like that. But, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about how we got here because here's the thing. I don't really know. I mean, yeah. I know some major things that obviously played into it that we can talk about. Some of those are easily replicable and some of them are not. And even if you don't care anything about growing a YouTube channel, I'm just glad you're here to celebrate with us. And we're going to continue to take theology and philosophy and type Bible questions and stuff uh, or whatever later on. But um, but I do want to say some things about this because some people might not know. So it takes a long time. I think someone said uh, the guy at our church said the other day that uh, Jimmy, Jimmy at church said that uh, Mr. Beast, um, who's a really famous YouTuber, like ordered it had a guy have you ever seen mr beast yeah they invited someone over for pizza or uh, or, sorry invited someone ordered a pizza from domino's and then when the guy got there they gave him a house basically nice and and so stuff like that um extreme acts of kindness filmed and put on tv or on youtube for us to enjoy but it took him years and years before he really saw any traction at all and we were doing it all wrong jonathan in but well, well, I wasn't actually contributing to anything. So, de- depending on were. depending on what you're wishing to accomplish, I guess yeah. we could say we were doing it wrong, and that is we weren't really engaging too much with other YouTubers. Really, we weren't uh, going on other YouTuber shows very often, and if we did, we were in a very tight circle um, around niches that we enjoyed, um, and we, you know, we we weren't we weren't focused in a way that I think we got focused, which is also something you don't like about what changed about the show. But, um, we used to be a show for those that go, you can still go back and watch all this stuff starting. We, yeah, it goes better. back, it goes back further, but in 2017, we started doing a YouTube show like this and we sit right over there in the corner. I don't know what we thought or I thought was good about that corner, but we did it there. Well, actually, and, yeah, we started over in that yeah, corner. Then and we, we came over the studio. We came over here and then we went there. We had Adam Roth. We had Sensei Roth yeah. for a while, who was part of the show. And um, and so what, what the, the goal was, was, uh, you know, OK, well, we're going to be a theology and apologetics type show, which is still kind of what we are. Um, we just t- answered a very doctrinal type question a moment ago, but, um, we became more of an apologetics focused channel, uh, after my debate with Matt Dillahunty and then after my debate with Dan Barker and on going forth with the response videos, but, uh, we did it wrong. And that was, we posted stuff. We did not post regularly. We got better about that, but for a long time, you never knew when we might put something out. Yeah. Right. And we never knew what we were going to talk about until day of, well, some things never change. Um, at least that when it comes to this Friday live stream. Well, my approach to this has always been the same. I enjoy doing this and I never expected anyone to watch it, but if people find value in what we're doing or they find entertainment or they find both, we will keep doing it because my, my first and foremost vocational calling is to be a seminary administrator and professor. 
And that is um, way ahead of being a notable YouTuber. That we have 15,000 subscribers is 15,000 more than I expected we would have. So I'm thankful for every single one of them, and I'm glad that that, that at least, uh, what, 10 to 15% of the, those subscribers watch any given video. So yeah. sometimes a little bit more. Uh, so that that's fine. We're gonna we would yeah, do you're, this. You're, you're great for a party, way. aren't you? Hey, look, Jimmy's here. Jimmy says, "Hey, Braxton, I'm hanging out and tuned in because I love YouTube." I well, do too. Homesteading channels are awesome. Fitness channels are awesome, and like uh, a couple of the, the 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 like news and commentary channels are awesome, and some Christian apologetics channels are awesome. That's what you took out of this comment. Is let's talk about all the things. We well, he said about he loves YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And, and and learning how to we watched a video to so that my son uh when he was visiting my oldest son came to visit and and the fact that you can pull up on YouTube how to fix a dryer mm -hmm. and he did by just watching the video because yeah. he's really yeah. adept to that sort uh that that kind yeah. of I'm not, you know, but but he is. So he just watched the video and then did it and it was like YouTube is great for learning how to fix appliances. Yeah, or finding out what you think about whether there's a God or not and how you should think about that. And so we I mean, but if people spent more time learning how to fix their own appliances, that would that would be practical. Yeah, that certainly would be practical. Because one thing one thing one thing you have, with any sort of niche, whether it's uh, apologetics or homesteading or fitness mm -hmm. or whatever, at some point you keep hearing the same thing over and over again at some point, right? You keep revisiting the same topics. Mm -hmm. And I think, I understand wanting to be focused, but the more you stay f laser focused, it can become redundant and repetitive. And well, that's one of the things. And so you have to balance that with the fact that new people are always tuning right, in right. while other people are always tuning you out. And so there's a yeah. cycle to that that you also have to think about uh, because new people will come in wanting to learn because they hear you're the place for that. And if you never get back to the basics and the fundamentals, they never pick that up from you. And so I, I think I think you have to weigh that in the balance. But I think one of the things that Eric Hernandez and I understand, and David Wood, it, it's got to be entertaining. The, the idea that all social media, that this is not, I don't treat this, nor would I treat this as an extension of my good but kind of you'd have to ask my i think they're pretty good but you'd have to ask my students like the, if i was just here to deliver a seminary lecture without any sort of colorful commentary to the subject matter which i can't do in the classroom because that would be obnoxious right so i want to be obnoxious here because i can't do it there but if i just repeated the same demeanor the same stuff that i do in our classes i i wouldn't want to watch it and i wouldn't want to do that so I, I think that there's got to be some sort of entertainment value. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, there was something I had to say, but it's long gone now. Good. But the thing about it is what, what the chain, I remember when we, for those of you out there that are struggling to get a hundred subscribers or 500 subscribers, it seemed like we took forever. I think it took a year after we tr started trying to get to 500 subscribers. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I thought, I'll tell you what I thought. I thought that, and this is, I don't, this is, this is going to sound arrogant, but I had traveled and spoken in a lot of churches, hundreds of churches, and I had pastored two churches, and I had an expansive newsletter um, with thousands of people on it. And I thought, okay, well, you know, um, day one on YouTube, we'll have 15,000 subscribers. I, I probably didn't think 15,000, but I thought a few thousand. Um, that did not happen. I one wonder of, if any one, of those 15,000 even read the newsletter you send them. One of the reasons why that doesn't happen uh, why that is, is because I was unaware or had not thought about the fact that the people who know who I am from churches uh, aren't necessarily YouTube users, right? So um, that's a big problem. So so you had to create, I had to create my own, our own sort of notoriety here as opposed to in the real world, so to speak. And in fact, I've often said Michael Icona was a huge help in the world of apologetics when it comes to speaking and going places and doing conferences and things. Michael Icona uh, took an interest in me when there was nothing to take an interest in at all, just because he was a good servant of the Lord. And Cameron Bertuzzi was that servant for me in the realm of YouTube. Um, that's, you know, Cameron, that's why he's had a tight relationship with his show 
um, for so long is because he, he really took an interest and kind of said, hey, you know, you, you made a response video to someone. Yeah, that was kind of fun. I probably won't do a lot of that. No, I think you should. That seemed to work. People watched that. And it just kind of took off from there. And uh, and but here's what I want to encourage you with. So I kept thinking if you're, if you're out there and you're trying, I kept thinking, well, if we can get you know, past a certain threshold, it will start happening a lot faster. The, the views will come in more exponentially. And everyone tells you that. And of course, it's true. I mean, the more people that know about you and are sharing your stuff and things like that, the more your channel will grow. Um, but the the thing about it is we didn't have that exponential growth. I mean, like. Um, it took a long time to get to 5,000. It took a long time to get to 10,000. It took less time than it took to get to 5,000, but it didn't, it didn't seem like it was flying by. And then something changed. And many of us talk about it. Um, I was talking to IP about it the other day and Cameron and I've talked about it. Something changed, um, uh, last fall. And it was like someone turned off the water in terms of, um, of views and subscribers. And it's, it was kind of interesting because you can look at your numbers and you can kind of see what it seems to be the case. As far as I could tell that YouTube, because the algorithms or something just wasn't throwing us out there as much to bigger audiences. And I don't think there's anything conspiratorial about that. Obviously we're a relatively small channel, but it was, um, it's just, they changed these things and, and it, it has worked against us now for a while. So it hasn't felt like it's gone by. So 15,000 has really felt like a milestone. Well, just uh, to put to this there. in perspective, uh, I, I went back to our Twitter feed and on February 4th of 2020, I retweeted a tweet that you made that, so that would be a little over two years ago. We that had, was the beginning of COVID then. Yeah, we had 5,000 subscribers. Okay. Because here's a here's your tweet that Braxton tweeted. Yeah. That it's not going to show up. And then I was <laughs> looking, but why did I find that before I found, I think I retweeted your, that the 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 Death Star Trench and the and the X-Way. Yeah, almost there. There, there it is. That, 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 that I don't know if y'all saw that. Almost there. Where, where you were talking about 10,000 subs. And that was December of 2020. So we went from 5,000 to almost 10,000 from February to uh, December, right? But then to go from that 10,000 to getting here from 15 to 15,000, all of 2021 and some of So it slowed down, mm -hmm. which means we started doing something wrong or YouTube changed an algorithm or whatever because- yeah. Every time yeah. you open your mouth on this stream, you bring the party down. Do you know that? <laughs> you're telling me, what is happening? It's all no, falling apart. Yeah, the we're, sky is but, falling. But we're discussing getting to 5,000 is what this was advertised. Yeah. I'm just, we're we're going to tell the truth. Yeah, I'm glad yeah. for this because yeah. I see people like uh, someone. It just, wasn't all awesome. It's like, wow, what were we doing in, in 2020? Uh, granted, people were at home and bored. Yeah. And we are the best thing on the internet. So no, I'm not something, surprised. That is that better? Stay on target. What yeah. did we say? Almost. No, Almost both of those there. are there. Yeah. Stay on target. Yeah. Almost there. Um, anyway, uh, Faithius Atheist says, when I was a kid, my youth pastor said not to pick and choose from the Bible, but I think we should pick and choose from social media. There's some great stuff and great relationships out there. Yes, that's right. Um, Michelle Turner says, I blame Pritchett. Um, I do too. No, now, Pritchett Prime. He's uh, I, Stop talking for a second. Okay. I want to say something. Um, so I was going to say is, yeah, we, we got a, something happened last fall and we're, it's, it's a reality. I don't know what it is. Maybe there's some tag I'm using or something I'm including that many apologists do. I, I don't know, but in any case it, it, we have now arrived at a place that I am not sure. I, I thought we would get there. Once I saw how hard it was, uh, 15,000 seemed like an eternity away. Yeah. And it's hard fought. Now, Cameron Bertuzzi created an awesome platform for getting people to discuss things um, on his show. And he, when he got 10,000, I don't know, was it like a year later he was at 100,000? Um, that didn't happen for us, did it, Pritchett? Nope. But, and it seems like that that last, we it seems like we were at like 14,600 for like, most of that time, and then all of a sudden it started. To, I mean, I just remember looking at it, it'd be, it was like 14.4k, 14.6k. It just seemed like it was forever. There was a time where that's what it was. 
Um, yeah, Billy says when some simple changes, when we came back, this is Billy Wendelin from the Bible bro down with Matt Chisholm about 90 days ago, we have gained 171 subs in, in 90 days, which is very good for us. We are a hundred subs from a thousand. That's yeah. awesome. A thousand is one of the huge, a hundred feels like a big milestone. Then a thousand's a milestone. Well, for 500, y'all should go back and look. We had Pritchett walking around downtown Evansville for 500 seconds. So that was fun. And the other day I convinced, I don't know if anybody saw it. Did you see that I convinced? The Justin Briley thing? Justin Briley. Yeah, Justin Briley has bongo drums in his background. I said, when you get to 175,000, which was arbitrarily chosen, well, not entirely arbitrarily chosen, I chose it because that would give him a few days or a few, maybe a few weeks, or I don't know exactly, but some time to maybe think about how he wants to do this or build up enthusiasm for this concert that I believe is going to happen. Because he tweeted back, or he retweeted my tweet, and he said, these, he said, those bongos have gone unused for far too long. On uh, and this is when we, when we get to one hundred and seventy five thousand, that all changes. That was pretty good, Justin Briarly, I think. Yeah, I told Pritchett he's required it's to better not than your say Sean bad things. It's about better my, than your Sean Connery. What's wrong with my Sean Connery, Junior? Anyway, um, Matt. <laughs> so let's look at some uh, Bet comments you try here. It all, maybe. First of all, um. The Timerarius Ultra, I don't even know. I'm loving the set. Thank you so, so much. He, you work, Braxton works so hard on that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. he will be in here moving stuff. And I mean, it's crazy how much effort he puts in. And I put in, again, no effort. But he really does a good job setting this stuff up. And so, yeah. And look I'm at little glad, Pritchett over there. I'm glad that people are taking notice. You look like pocket size Pritchett yeah. in this setup. Well, it's because, lean up close so they can see what it's supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. No, closer, close. Okay, that's what he's. Well, a little back. Yeah, that, that's what it's supposed to look like. But I can't get him to sit straight. So, um, hey, I went for years being the posture police around here, and you never. Uh, it was easy to ignore you then because you were. The over. problem is you need is, to get in shape. <laughs> the, if you can see that, I, I mean, sitting like this, and th it's this chair. It's not my posture. Uh, Jeremy Scott to Spain says. Thank you for encouraging me. Still trying to break a thousand stubs, subs. Make God known and he will give the increase in due season. Good work, man. Amen. Yeah, you know, and, and one of the stay, things... Oh, go sorry. Ahead. Well, I was going to say, and st here's the thing that we didn't do right, I think, in the beginning, too. When we were under a thousand subs and we were excited if we had like 30 views, it's that you and I were not consistent every week. Yeah. And, and, and we were not, um, we were not consistent... Um, in the sense that sometimes we would say, okay, we're going to film 10 episodes straight then take a few months off or whatever. We'll come back after <laughs> yeah. the holiday or whatever. Uh, don't do that. Even if it's just drivel, put it out there. Yeah. And, um, another thing to keep in mind is, um, we were, we were making content and I'm not sure we knew exactly why we were making it. We, we, I mean, it was too put our thoughts out there. Ideally evangelism is always our goal and everything, but it's like, who are you talking to at first? And you can feel like you're talking to no one. The great thing is some of that content back then gets fired up again years later when you have more of an audience and you can, you can still pull from that stuff. But, um, but in any case, I think what one of the things that we did um, wrong and, and we knew we were doing it wrong and still know we're doing it wrong and continue to do it wrong. And we'll probably continue to do it wrong is that, it's really good if back to the focus issue, you have one type of content and you do that all the time and you do that with consistency and it's about the same length and all those things, because here's a simple thought. What if you, what, what if someone comes to your channel and they, and you did something a little bit, you know, something that every fifth video you do is like this and you made that video and that video really just kind of for you went viral, maybe not by YouTube standards, but by your standards, it went viral. Okay, well, great. But then your next video is about your dog or something. And all those people that came for that video that really spiked you, it's like, well, what are you giving them? And so it's good to have another video after a big video like that that's similar. And so if that stands to reason, then it stands to reason that if you focus on one thing, you can grow really fast. Now, of course, once you get to a certain point, you can branch out and offer different things. And then you can get a wider audience that way. But that's kind of been some standard advice. Um, but of course, if you're trying to do something for ministry purposes and not just to get a big YouTube channel, well, then you have multiple goals like Pritchett and I do. Like I have the goal of wanting to, on the one hand, 
produce verse by verse content on the Bible, which I realize is going to be the least popular stuff on our channel. But the people that love it probably love it harder than anybody else loves anything on our channel. And so I and, and I think God wants us to do that. And so that's a whole different thing. And then, of course, I'm not going to stop doing the apologetic stuff. And then, of course, you're not going to stop wanting to do the theology stuff. And I'm not going to want to stop wanting that either. Right. So it's going to be several things and different lengths and all that. So I just know we're going to grow slower, slower, and I just have to be aware. Okay yeah, but but I think that there you 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 stay at something long enough. Like the idea that any theology geek would be interested in fitness. I mean, my goodness, no wonder my channel's going nowhere on that 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 end. I mean, <laughs> just look at everyone we feature on the channel besides me. Kidding, not. Uh, but you know, I think you never know. These things take time, and you never know what the audience wants or if what you offer is what an audience wants. But I think there's given what you can find on YouTube, there's an audience for literally everything. It's just a matter of gaming that system and being consistent because if you hang around long enough, but if you get into this wanting to be a big YouTuber instead of wanting to uh, do this, you know, for other reasons, you can, I mean, we obviously you want to glorify God in all your activities or whatever, but I mean, I don't think, I want to glorify God on YouTube. I, let's admit it, that's not the, that's just pious talk sometimes. I mean, that's what you want to do, but that's not why you're starting a YouTube channel. There's also something else, right? So as long as that something else is not, I want to be a big time YouTuber, because that won't happen in the beginning. And whatever methods that people were using to game the system five, ten years ago, YouTube has cleaned all that out, right? There's no, you What's know, that? What to, about? to game the system, YouTube is kind of cleaned Oh, yeah, up. yeah, they figure stuff out yeah. all the time. And yeah. I hear prominent YouTubers outside, because I don't just, I hardly ever watch this kind of thing, but um, I hear them talk about how YouTube now does not, they actively work against new channels growing. Because they're more regulative on the kind of content that they're going to, you know, there's gatekeepers at YouTube now, and they're very picky about what kind of content they want to platform. And when they start recommending, like, you know, certain things on your main page or whatever, it's because they have a vested interest in what's already popular mm -hmm. to continue to generate money for them. Mm -hmm. So YouTube is, I've, from what I understand, it's harder now than it's ever been to get going on it. Well, I think there was a gold rush for a time, and yeah. that's certainly true. And I wanted to spotlight Jimmy Marshall again here because I know I put him up already and we want to get to other comments and stuff. But uh, Jimmy is, there's something I've just remembered that I should say. Jimmy handles a lot of the social media and stuff for our church at One Life Network. And you can find that at One Life Network on YouTube or uh, lots of other places, all the other social places. And um, we just had Eric Hernandez at our church this past Sunday, didn't we, Jonathan? We did. And we had him on the show. Well, our church is on TikTok, TikTok now, and I didn't even know our church was on TikTok. I didn't either. And Jimmy cut several, I think, uh, clips of Eric speaking. They don't know who Jimmy and, is. And Jimmy, he's right here on the screen. Jimmy, Jimmy, oh. cut. we're talking about Jimmy. Oh, I didn't, hi, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, but Jimmy is the guy that goes to our church. Yes, I just said that. that. Oh, I wasn't even paying attention. Dang it, Pritchett. Sorry. Jimmy. This, Sorry, I, I don't listen to you when you talk. That's the thing. Jimmy, um, um, we're talking about Jimmy. Yes, Jimmy's <laughs> awesome. And his hair does rival. Jimmy took clips of Eric Hernandez. His hair totally rivals Cameron's, too. Right? I think that's a fair, we should do a, some kind of a competition. But we're, we're not right now. And please let me say this about Jimmy. Okay. Jimmy is handling our TikTok that I didn't know we had. And he put some clips out of Eric. And one of those clips... Got, I don't know where it is now. Jimmy could tell us, but like over 70,000 views. Right. And like uh, over a thousand hearts and comments and all. And I'm, I understand that the metrics on all these sites are a little different, but I understand that's still huge, you know, for someone, for a random person um, on TikTok. So he kind of knows what he's doing with some of this stuff. So listen to him. And he says, I think YouTube goes through seasons, different types of content perform really well for a time. I think the content can be the same, but the method can change. And that's kind of, and that's sort of the, you know, it's hard to write books about YouTube and people do write books. 
And of course, I, we had talked some of us with Sean McDowell about writing a book about YouTube at one point, um, Christian stuff on YouTube. But everything changes so fast. Right. And the algorithms change and the way things work change. And of course, there's some things that might seem like they're going to be true um, for a long time into the future. But but there's so many things that, are, that, that change. And so as a result of that, you have to figure out and these videos have to of people trying to figure out how YouTube works. They kind of have to figure out and then tell you, Oh yeah, well the thing that changed, if you're having this problem, stop doing this in your videos or stop, you know, clicking this box or whatever. And you have to figure all that stuff out. And I've never been able to figure out what happened last fall <laughs> that changed. Um, did you say, by the way, did you say something horrible last fall or something? And that's the result of this. And I just don't remember. Is I that mean, that's, happened? I'm sorry, Chances did you say that, more horrible things than usual last week? Yeah, fall? I mean, that's <laughs> definitely possible, right? <laughs> All right, well, thanks, I mean, Jimmy. Braxton, We're is, glad you're Braxton here. does want me to go away. I do Oops. not. He really does want this channel all to himself and would rather me not be, but he started this with me and now he feels obligated he found me to out. keep me around. He found me out. And, and, and I am holding the channel back because I probably say things that... No, Pritchett. I say the kind true. of things that would get... 76,000 angry people on TikTok, though. Now, now. Here's so go the cut thing. out all that stuff where I'm like, yeah, Jesus drowned babies and go put that on TikTok. And I guarantee you that's the kind well, of stuff. Well, that's that... maybe doesn't bring the, exactly what would, <laughs> the thing about but that that's is the kind of thing that no, Eric the power said. of yeah. people don't know what you're talking about, but it was an answer. It was it, don't even go into detail about this any more than this, but just to say that uh, there are atheists on occasion. And Pine Creek was one such with some kind of a list of things that apologists won't admit. And how every time I hear anyone, oh, I, I mean, not every time, almost every time I hear an atheist say on a video, um, well, Christians, Christian apologists won't admit this. And, and almost every time I'm like, well, like we say that all the time. <laughs> right. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And so, yeah, the idea that, that, uh, that the judgment of the flood that did kill women and children if understood in the, in the way that traditionally is, you know, like a literal understanding of that and all, um, it, it, that God was the one who brought that judgment and, and that Jesus children died God. in that. And yes, that's all. Yes, that's true. And, and the, and, and of course the idea that, um, you won't answer it without caveating. And of course we will, but no Pritchett, you, we are famous for the good cop, bad cop dynamic. Well, we're not famous. People who know who we are know about that. We are moderately internet famous. Moderately. In a small corner niche of <laughs> yeah. YouTube. That is now at 15,000. Yeah. Yay. All right. So. Um, no, but Eric, Eric, the, the clip that Eric was, was brilliant because it, it was like when someone asked you, do you give me some scientific evidence for the existence of God? And Eric says, why would I do something silly like that? And that that warms my heart and it it got like so many people howling at him for saying that and some christians too because christians don't like it when you actually say the things that pine creek says that we won't say and we'll say it so you can always upset i mean christians get upset all right here we go let's answer some questions uh trinity radio does artificial insemination create a problem for the existence of a god i can't possibly see how um, yeah, um, I, I saw this earlier and I thought it was interesting because um, whatever, even, even on special creationism or uh, tradu traducianism, whatever was necessary to create um, from the life from the human side of things has been achieved. And so whatever, whichever view you take that instant God instantly creates the soul or the soul is transmitted uh metaphysically in the same way it is physically through just is that what you think this question is getting at because i have no idea it doesn't say anything about that it just says does artificial insemination create a problem for the existence of god it, no because uh, well i don't know what that has to do with the soul or anything else i understand what you're saying you're like yeah. whether you take a traducian view which is the view right. that just like sexual union brings about the physical physical uh, structure of the new human being and all right, that. Right, so ar artificial... The, the spiritual is the same way. That's yes. the traducian. Yeah, and, ar and artificial assimilation uh, does nothing... You still have all the genetic... You still have all that. Right, and so the fact that you can... This scientific technology exists to do this does nothing to... to, to have cause a problem for the soul. 
or the existence of God. Well, I just, I don't even know. They didn't even give that level of the argument. It sounds like you're responding to some argument that I've never heard about this issue about that shows God doesn't exist or something. Well, because I've be, not yet been be, given it, an argument that I God doesn't exist. I guess it would be the implication, and this is kind of something you run into with... Well, this is what Eric said last week is, you know, I'm not saying this to you, uh, uh, Dax, uh, just saying it in general. Um, I can't presume to know what objection they're trying to make, and I shouldn't try to help make an objection that I don't... Like, what am I trying to do? Create a steel yeah, man? Yeah, but this of, is just a question. Yeah. It's not an I know, argument but I, against God. I, I know, but I'm saying I don't even know what the objection is supposed to be. Right. Well, I could see that that if... if 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 uh, I could see something like related to physicalism and just, just naturalism and, and stuff. And that would be a problem for Christian physicalism. You're saying if you artificial... Don't God for, you don't need God's existence for, no. for a person's existence. You're saying right? that artificial insemination... You're saying that what someone could be saying with something like this is artificial insemination... If artificial insemination is possible, it seems like the soul doesn't instantiate as we think it does because we think it requires two people or something like that yeah. is the assumptions. There's several assumptions there. And yeah. then um, from there, if the soul doesn't exist, that's supposed to show the soul doesn't exist. And if the soul doesn't exist, it's supposed to show God doesn't exist. Right. And those are like multiple huge leaps that I don't know what the connecting material is. I don't either, but I'm just trying to answer. The, well, the answer to the question is, is no, no, but I'm trying to possible reasons why someone might think it could be yes. Well, the good news is, uh, Dax, we're glad you're here. We're glad you asked this interesting question. And feel free to elaborate, and we'll try to answer further. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, the TU is how I'm going to say this. says, I found out about Trinity Radio on Capturing Christianity. Yes, thank you so much for that, Cameron. Uh, thank you for helping, yeah. letting me be on your channel so much. And thank you. Um, yeah, I've only been on there once. TU for showing up here. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people are saying they found out about me through the Dillahunty debate, and that's no surprise. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, that's honestly atheist saying that. Uh, Bertuzzi has way cooler hair. Pretty sure that 90,000 difference can be attributed to that. I think you're on to something. I think you're on to something, Adam. Um, okay. Braxton Here's a good Dilla question. Hunter. Wasn't that Matt Chisholm's thing? The Dilla Dilla Hunter. Hunter. Braxton the Dilla Hunter. Braxton the Dilla Hunter. Um, on my... On my uh, I had a PlayStation for a short time. My screen name there was Hadron the Collider. And I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. Anyway, do you see yourself continuing to be the ministry that quote unquote loves atheists? Or do you see yourself taking new approaches as you grow? Congrats on 15,000. So we will always be a channel that loves atheists. Because we love everyone. Um, but will we, I think I take the meaning of your question. Am I, are we going to continue to have this focus on atheism? And I think, uh, yes, though not exclusively. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I would say that in the last six to eight weeks, we've not really spent a whole lot of time just focused on that at all. And uh, But I always want to have that as an aspect of this because a, a large part of the audience um, appreciates that sort of content and finds some value in it. And so I, as long as we're able to produce content that is still valuable and and saying something that still matters and hasn't already been said on our channel to our audience then we'll we'll continue to say it um i think but, also that the deconstruction thing people really seem to be interested in what this channel has to say about deconstruction too because that always got a lot of views and yeah. so i i think that you and i offer something different on deconstruction than a lot of these other apologetics channels because a lot of the apologetic channels don't have the benefit that you and I have. And I, and I, and I'm not trying to brag on ourselves. It's just life experience that you and I have both been pastors and associate pastors and stuff and act, you know, in church. And because we have that instead of just having, uh, which is good for us as professors as well, when you're in the Academy that you actually have the, you know, we're not just those who can't professors teach can people. be boring because they don't think about how people hear them talk think right. about okay think about frank turek and all the things you want to say bad about frank turek or think about uh maybe um tim mcgrew tim mcgrew is a really fun communicator okay really really enjoyable to listen to now i don't know what his background is but pastors and people who have been in public ministry um in front of like church type audiences 
are, are often very good communicators as opposed to people who have been lifelong professors or career professors and never did any public speaking besides that. And here's why. Because if you are a professor, you don't have to worry about your content being that interesting. You don't have to worry about people enjoying stuff. You know, uh, Elliot said, if, if, if it's not entertained, it won't be listened to, whether you like that or not. But when you're a professor, it doesn't matter because those students paid for this and they have to learn this one way or the other. It's on them to learn it, not me to make it learny and then, and then do all that, yeah. right? Okay, but a pastor has people that we don't have to be here. We don't have to listen to you. And we don't, ha and, and, you know, if you don't communicate it right, we're not going to get it. And we don't have to take a test on it. It goes beyond just communication. And so though. pastors know yeah. how to, they have to think about how they're being heard more than I think professors do. Yeah. And not just professors, but just apologetics channels that they don't have any pastoral experience because, and it's not just about how you communicate certain things. Pastoral experience gives you this in real time, this in real space, right? You've seen deconstructions. You see how it affects people in church, right? Mm -hmm. And without pastoral experience, you may have a friend or whatever, but you're not in that fight like a pastor's in that fight. Mm -hmm. And so I think pastors are often unappreciated for their insights into all of these topics, yeah. whether it's apologetics or theology yeah. or anything else. And one of the things that, that we try to do at Trinity, and we need to do more of at Trinity Radio, is intersect the church with the academy. Right? Yeah, well, that we did used to do more of that. That's yeah. true, and we should do more of that. Um, but like, here's an example of something. I put this in my book, Letters uh, from Ignorantia, that is my satire on Christianity in the West today. But um, in in that book, I was I was uh, well, I completely lost it now. Oh, you'll you'll be talking to uh, so. Uh, a bunch of seminarians who think they're smarter than everybody else. Not the seminarians are always that way. We're seminarians and we work at a seminary, but uh, the puffed up seminarian that thinks that his pastor back home didn't know nothing growing up and he's gone to seminary now and his, he's got this professor that's got it figured out and maybe he holds some different doctrinal positions and he thinks that guy knows everything. And that guy says that expository preaching must be done in the following manner. And, and if it's done any other way, then, then it's wrong. And it's this very, ver always verse by verse within a, one particular pericope or section of texts and, um, and, and doing it like that. And not jumping around to see what the Bible says on a given topic around the Bible, as if that can't be done in a manner that's expository in one way. But anyway, so he listens to that, and this kid gets all that. So on the weekend, he goes out and hears some country preacher near his seminary preach. A guy who doesn't have any kind of, you know, uh, degrees or anything. And that guy jumps all over the Bible preaching a not expository, but totally biblically faithful and totally being faithful to what those verses mean in the passage and context right. they mean in across the Bible to make a point about, let's say, forgiveness or about the nature of God, let's say, um, or Jesus. All right, and they do that, and they make fun of him because he didn't do it. Doesn't he know this bumpkin doesn't know? You can't just jump around the Bible. But then they'll go into their systematic theology class on Monday morning and listen to this lofty professor jump all over the Bible and draw things together about a, doctrine, a particular yeah. doctrine and in precisely the way the preacher did, and that's acceptable. You right. know, that's that. I'm just yeah. We have actually in back at the old audio. Uh, days, the audio only days. I think we did a whole show. I, I think two shows. One show we did it where you and I are just debunking a lot of these myths about topical versus exposed. Mm -hmm. And then we had a show with Paul Cooper on, I think. Oh yeah. And yeah. we and we went he was through still a Calvinist back then. He was still a Calvinist back then. And some of those some of those audio I mean Pritchett Prime originated in the <laughs> audio podcast. Right. I mean some of those things are just absolute gold. And and one of the things that I want to say back to the YouTube thing though. And, well, and speaking about having more passion. I want to finish on, off with Kevin. Okay. At some point, what I was going to say to Kevin is we never answered his question and I haven't talked openly with you about this, Pritchett. Um, and you have, a, you have a fair say in what we do on this show and, um, when it comes to things that matter. Um, and I don't, I don't know what you think about this, but I think that as you know, I teach a class on world religions at Trinity mm -hmm. and as Islam is more and more forced all the time, I'm thinking there needs to be more content on Trinity radio maybe almost as much focusing on Islam as on atheism. I, 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 I mean, we could, 
uh, we need to do a You're lot speechless. of speechless. We need to do a lot of things as much as we do atheism. Islam, if like for the United States context, is not. You know, I think I actually th- you're not going to do better than David Wood, and that pretty much. Right, and you know, what's happening with David Wood? No, he's getting off YouTube. Exactly. And it does. It does make it uh, build a hole, but but I think when I think about our context, do you know how many Muslims there are on planet Earth? Yes, but you know how many are in the United States. It's it's the future's problem, and the future is coming fast. Not of not that having Muslims in the United States is a problem, but ideologically, the challenge that will present for Christianity. Yeah, one of the things that I think about, and for people to think about when it comes to doing a YouTube channel, and you want it to grow, not necessarily for only selfish reasons, even though it is there, uh, it's kind of like church growth. Are you making content for the audience you don't have yet but want, or are you making content that's that's going to be, one, of value, and two, of value for the, the people that are currently watching? Same thing with growing a church. Are you preaching and trying to do things if you're a pastor? Are you trying to grow the church that you don't have but want instead of feeding the flock that you, you have? And so I think about it in those kind of terms. Uh, when I think about content, and I think about what are, what are people who are, have already got us to where we are what are they interested in? And atheism. it turns out, um, atheism, and athe- some theology, atheism and theology. <laughs> I mean, are well, the people who actually really pay the bills is not the mm-hmm. people who click and watch the ad, but it's the people that mm-hmm. are patrons. And I'm doing a series on Calvinism. <laughs> so, you are doing a series on Calvinism. Right. That's true. Which is what the kind of thing that they want. And they're like, well, I mean, you, you are doing more? a series on Calvinism yeah. and I love that you're doing that. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, you just not that that proves anything. <laughs> I'm just saying, what, 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 what is a value mm-hmm. do you have to offer if you're doing a YouTube? It can't channel? be Calvinism all the time, Jonathan. That's Leighton Flowers' channel, right? And so why are you wanting to make it Calvinism all the time on Trinity Radio? Because I handle the topic better than he does. Well, okay, but it can't be every week. Just kidding. Right. That's why it's for the patrons. But. Plus, I, right, I don't well, we're handle talking it. about. I don't handle it. I just repeat what Leighton Flowers says when I agree with him. But no, I'm just kidding. All right. Well, but we got to move do it on with more questions. Like the way we got to stop this. talking about this picture. Right. We got to move on. All right. So uh, let's see here. Question. Are you planning on doing another verse by verse series? Currently in the midst of a verse by verse, but I have to apologize to those that do love the verse by verse that for the past two weeks, there hasn't been one. And I'm not quitting. Um, it's just that it takes more effort sometimes than other things that we do around here. Right. And so, uh, but I mean, I've like, haven't gotten back to my first Peter in like how many years now it's because you can't figure out, you can't figure out what he thinks about the next verse. But, um, the thing is, (laughs) the thing is, um, it, it, you want it, I want it to be quality. I don't want to give an inferior product. And if I haven't had time to be able to focus on it enough, I want to do that. So, but anyway, uh, Jude, and then after Jude, I'm not sure. I'm but at least you finished that. all of yours without starting and stopping in the middle. I can't say the same thing. I, no, I didn't. Oh, no. you haven't finished you? I haven't finished you, no. I thought you did. No, no, we're still in the middle. We haven't finished it yet. It's so short. Hurry I know. Up. We've done six episodes. The next one will probably be the last one, but I don't know. And I'll probably do one and then do a recap. I want to do a last one, and then I want to go through the whole thing, like just through the book again, just read it and comment verse by verse in like five minutes. So that to get this, to get a smooth, here's with all, if you want it all unpacked, there's the whole series, yeah. but a nutshell now with all of that to kind of cement it, we're going to walk through it again. So anyway, that's what I'm planning. And then after that, I, I really don't know, but I'm, I'm thinking something else, new test, new Testament. So, um, all right. So, uh, let's see now here's an interesting one and not the first time I've gotten this question. What tips or guidance would you... First of all, I shouldn't be the person giving advice to many people anyway because 15,000 isn't a huge channel. But what tips or guidance would you have for an aspiring atheist content creator other than to repent and accept Jesus into their heart asking for a friend? So now I will be... I will be... Here's where I think we can... um, Here's what I think you can you can do in terms of how to present atheism, the content. Obviously, you're not asking me about that and you wouldn't want my input on that. But in terms of the how to handle YouTube, I, I, I'm not into helping atheists have better channels. But I think that the stuff that is true about YouTube that we're saying here and true in general about 
how good healthy channels grow. And we just, we still do things wrong. Like I say, some of that knowingly and some I'm sure unknowingly. Um, but I think all the, all this stuff is applicable. I mean, we're trying, we're doing a very similar thing. Atheists and Christians are both having worldview discussions. And if you boil it down to that, then a lot of the stuff is works across the way. Well, here, here's the, here's the thing. Um, the, the, that I think about, I'm not going to tell you what I would want from an atheist channel because uh, that would just be self-serving, right? Uh, but there seems to be atheist channels are a lot like Christian channels. They're all different. They all have different personalities or whatever. Um, I gravitate towards um, either the more obnoxious ones. Um, or, or the, 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 the really interesting ones that go beyond just the atheist topic, but do any number of, but in all that, there is like this typical YouTube atheist channel, right? And I can't, where, where, whether it's a 20 minute video or a nine hour video or whatever, I'm just not slogging through all that when they're trying to impress themselves, right? At least the obnoxious atheists are entertaining to watch. And we kind of secretly admit that to ourselves that, I mean, <laughs> that was actually kind of funny, right? Even if they're making fun of us. I laugh constantly. Right. Yesterday, Pine Creek was doing a show about us and Eric. Yeah. And as I was getting out of the car to go into, um, to talk with, you know, you and Brett and Natalie at church um, about, you know, how things went last week at church with Eric. Um, I get, I get out and, um, I'm listening to he's and Pine Creek was talking about you and he's like, Oh, I actually agree with Jonathan here about something. I don't know. So, um, but, but I, but I listen yeah. to those things. And when they, when you, when it's a thing that's making fun of even me, yeah. I'll laugh. And I think part of that is I don't encourage people to like, uh, go crazy. You know, I think you should be careful what you're, you know, watching, you know, you want to watch stuff that's giving you good, solid, like the good, the, the objections that are credible objections. Right. Yeah. Um, if, if you're interested in looking at the objections, I, I think either pick, has, but that yeah. said, we're in a very niche place in yeah. the worldview discussion arena and there's not much entertainment content there, like you say. Yeah. And so there are a couple of channels that are atheists that are making fun of me sometimes. And I find it hilarious because it's a very niche type of humor that not many people have access to. And I get it and I find it funny. Yeah. yeah. So it's either the ones that actually have something interesting to say or the mm -hmm. ones that are just funny to watch. What I don't like is the typical you atheist YouTuber channels where they just prattle on and I cannot stand just constant dialogues. I'm sorry. That like is we're doing so boring. No, the dialogue like does God exist? Did Jesus write? I mean, these same old conversations that just week. Gregory week, Fisher says, man. so will you now be scheduling seminars for pastors how to break the 15,000 barrier? Well, we could. We could. I give the same advice to pastors, to YouTubers, to Christian apologists, to future ministry leaders who speak. My, my, the one thing that I say, if you want to be, if you want to be great at it, be awesome. Richard, I'm actually going to make a response video first of next week to the video you made recently about the spectrum, because uh, you mentioned that we're both on the spectrum, not the one you're thinking of or any of the ones you're probably thinking of. But uh, we're going to talk about that early next week. Um, you are such a sweet guy, and I appreciate your um, friendliness on these various platforms. Absolutely. And um, yeah. Kevin did send in his video for the pull-up challenge. Richard, uh, I'm still waiting on yours. And, and thank you for that substantial And even, even uh, Nathan Ormond, is that how you say his name? Uh, the digital gnosis guy is supposed yeah. to be making a submission to uh, of his pull-ups. So we're waiting. Eric Hernandez and Adam Coleman. Yes, Adam Coleman are the best. I agree. Those are my two favorites. Phil Fox is pretty awesome. I like Phil Fox. MJ Jackson is good, but if you're watching MJ, you don't put out videos often enough. You're like me. And you, you're just like, yeah, I'll, I'll get, get to it. That's how I am, I know. Bridget strikes again. Ding. Yes. Trinity Radio and Jimmy Marshall. You guys should do a TikTok or just the moments when Braxton has to fuss at Pritchett for not paying attention or to stop talking would be gold. Well, see, now here's the problem. That might be gold. You're right. 
But there are a lot of things, and Pritchett has a list a mile long of things that he would love to do on Trinity Radio that are basically glorified inside jokes that five people would get. And I get a little bit of that flavor there, although maybe not. Maybe people would find it interesting even if they don't know us. But um, for this is why Trinity Radio Extra was created, folks. Trinity Radio Extra was created for, you know, we could throw whatever there that we weren't sure we wanted to put on the main channel. But then also, Jonathan could talk more about theology. And then also, Bible bouts, debates yeah. about silly trying stuff. To get, trying to get other people. Like best Bible kill or yeah, things like that. Yeah, trying to get people to do all that. I figured out that that uh, people are boring and they don't they, they hate they're anti-fun. Trying to get people Actually, it's also a scheduling nightmare, but yeah. Um Braxton says the things that keep atheists here. Pritchett says the things that keep the Christians here. Thank <laughs> Dang you. Dang it. He figured out the special sauce. Yes. They all they've been circling it like sharks for years with the Good cop, bad cop thing. Yeah. But that's that's actually Yes. And it was by design. Totally. Good. I mean, it kind of was by design, honestly. That's why part of the why we got you here was okay. Right. Jimmy says, um, there was a question that I heard what thank you for being the guest today, Jimmy. Yes. Um there was if a only question he was on here. That I heard right? one time that really changed my thinking. Ask the question, would one million people want to watch this video? And for a lot of videos people make, that's not true. Yeah, and that's and I think generally what we're trying to do is we're trying to make we're trying to get our message out. And you think, well, a million people, come on, a million people. Yeah, well, if there's two billion user accounts for <laughs> YouTube or something, there's a million people out there. But if it's not going to be interesting for at least a million, then actually what it tells you is you've got a terrible topic. <laughs> right. It's well, I think of it like this: aim for a million. Uh, if a million people would want to watch it, and and we get into this kind of thinking too. And it goes back to even what I was saying. Does it provide value? It's like, it's like, we think, we think we want to do this because people should watch it. Right. That's your thinking. I'm going to talk about this Bible topic or this, this apologetics issue or this atheist argument or whatever. And people should watch this. Mm -hmm. But the question that, that Jimmy's showing us is would they, and that's a very important question because if a million people will watch it, you might actually get 5,000 uh, views on your channel and that's amazing so always aim for the million and maybe you get more than you get oh man okay kevin says do you think that the claim god exists is unfalsifiable or is it falsifiable unfalsifiable is the view that eric seemed to take but he's not here so i ask you both so just to refresh real quick for anybody that's new to this stuff fall for some uh, you know often a good theory often a good theory is falsifiable and if you're doing like um if, if you're doing like some worldview analysis or assessments and trying to Think about what's reasonable to think. You know, uh, if a theory is falsifiable, that's a that's a that's something about it that's perhaps virtuous because it it kind of means you're presenting uh, evidence and you're putting some stakes out there. So, like, uh, I think the Christian God is falsifiable. I do too. Now, what the, now that doesn't mean I think that God in general is falsifiable. I do too. I I mean I I do think that as well. You agree I think with me? Or you think I think Christianity is falsifiable, and I think the question of God. Just because it hasn't been doesn't mean that it is okay, not. Okay, but I'm still not done explaining yeah. what it is first. So for something to be, so falsifiability means in principle, there is a way you could show it to be false if it were false. So if you think that Jesus bodily rose from the dead, um, then uh, you could falsify that. And I'm not, pre I'm not presenting this as the thing. I'm just giving an example. One could falsify that by presenting uh, something that is unquestionably the bones of Jesus or something. Oh, but Braxton, we, how would we ever unquestionably? Well, that that's not the point. I'm just providing an example right now to try and say that would be something that would make false the claim that Jesus rose bodily from the dead, perhaps. Okay. So it's falsifiable. It's, we don't think he, we think he did rise bodily from the dead, but we're happy to tell someone that if they could show X, Y, and Z, it would demonstrate that we're wrong. Okay. That's, that's helpful. Okay. Now, um, when it comes to the Christian God, when it comes to the Christian God, God is defined as uh, by most Christians as an all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing, um, morally good God, morally perfect God. Okay, now that means that you could, in principle, um, falsify the existence of this God in precisely the way that Epicurus. Um, 
presents and Hume echoes. And it is this idea that um, if you could show some contradiction in God's nature so defined. And so this is why the old problem of evil argument crops up. If God's all loving and all knowing and all powerful, then whence cometh evil, right? It seems like he's missing one of those attributes, then he's not God or something, or he's an evil God or something. So um, so I think the Christian God is falsifiable. You could demonstrate that the Christian God does not exist. The Christian God's so defined as most Christians define him. Now, could I show that some nebulous God uh, does not exist? Jonathan, you think one, you think that is a falsifiable claim. So talk about that, the claim that the God of the philosophers because they're always looking for contradictions in the nature of the God of the philosophers in order to demonstrate. So I just being, bear, just yeah. bear uh, a creator. God exists. That is personal. And that's all we know. It, can you falsify that? I think if you could philosophically show that an immaterial being that, that has, that has a personhood is logically impossible. Yeah. How would how? It's not my job. Well, you basically just said, <laughs> "Yeah, I could if I could show that it was logically impossible." <laughs> right. That's false. Well, yeah, that I'm means saying, it could be Okay, but 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 with Christian theism, we're, we can present several ways. Like, there's not just the problem of evil. There's also the omnipotence paradox, the omniscience paradox, and there's other things we could talk about that are alleged. Uh, contradiction or incoherences in the nature of God or Jesus didn't rise from the dead or something like that. Yeah. yeah. But, but with, but with just bare theism, what is the con, what are some possible contradictions that you see that would render this God, this philosopher's creator, God, um, the uh, false Bible. I don't know. Yeah. It seems like it seems like if you could show that it's logically impossible for an immaterial personal being to exist, then at just at bare minimum, and then you know. Now, something not being false. Now, it is also true that just because you can't falsify something doesn't mean it's not true. Right. That's right? true as well. So that that can still be the case, but it's just an interesting. All right. So let's uh, let's move on here. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, let's see, what are some theological conundrums you are currently working through? Pritchett? None, because I, 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 I want to find time to get around to eschatology the way that I found time to get around the eternal versus conditional security issue. Because I had some time, and I really explored that and came to the conclusion that Eternal security is false. Mm -hmm. I have not been able to. Have, so, I mean, what conundrum, I, I, I'm still kind of, I default to a mill just because that's kind of what I'm used to, but I, I that's, that's lean that way. I, I'm not firmly committed. I think eschatology is a conundrum for me, mainly because I haven't time to give every position it's, it's due. And so, um, I don't know if that counts as a conundrum, but not knowing what position to take firmly is a conundrum, and I think it's something well, I want to investigate and sort out. This will tick everyone that's an open theist off, but I am currently a firmly convinced um, believer that God has exhaustive knowledge of all things, um, including future events of free creatures, and that those are things that God can know. Um, but I, I, I have recently been kind of interested in... Uh, again, in issues related to God's knowledge of a potentially infinite future and the events and, and things like that and how that plays against or with open theism and uh, how that swims with the idea of God having exhaustive knowledge. I think there's some interesting stuff to talk about there. So, But that's kind of what I'm thinking about. And Pritchett's told you, so thanks, Jeremy Scott. And I see you got some subs out of this. I'm glad you did. All right. Um, oh, okay. So Dax is back again explaining this. If people can artificially make man, why would God be necessary? I'm a Christian, by the way. Yeah, I thought you might be. So, so here's the thing. It is artificially making man in the sense that it's not being done in the traditional way, and it's being done artificially in the sense that it's being do done in, in a way other than the typical standard approach. Right. But um, it's it's still not artificial in the sense that 
you're you're still taking male biological material and female biological material and putting them together to create new life. And that is all done with God's uh, stuff. That's God's stuff you did that with. Now, um, I think what you, I mean, if it was something like, uh, we would need an example of something that I don't think exists yet, like um, some kind of an android that we're talking about as a person or not, that maybe has some biological aspect to it or something. And this is, boy, this is sounding like old school Trinity Radio. We're over here talking about cyborgs. But um, I don't know. But it's an interesting, interesting discussion, I guess. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's try to get some people we haven't. What results from exception? You're looking for. I, you know, there we've. There's a lot of see, stuff. See, when you start here. doing that, that's where we start. Well, the problem stuff. is, it went by. So um, we. I, I didn't. There's there, the questions. Mr. Come Green way says faster. all Calvin all day. I. You know. See, that's the thing. I would love to just sit there and do chapter by chapter through each book in the in the institutes, and then I guarantee you five people would care. That's that's the Jimmy question. That, that do, would a million people care to hear Pritchett talk about the institutes? No. <laughs> so so you don't do it. Right, but Jimmy says here, I think you can create content that people who don't know you will care about as well as providing value to the people that continue to support you. I think it's both and. Yeah, but still five of our supporters would care. They would give up after like chapter three. They're like, this is boring. So I don't, uh, all Calvin, it'd just be the two of us. And I mean, you could probably do that yeah. just as well as I could. Right? The channel that helps atheists get their YouTube channel off the ground. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right. Um, really, it, I see a lot of people jump into into this YouTube thing and then jump out of it just as quick because it didn't go the way that they thought they did. And that's where you have to balance the do a million people should would a million people want to watch this? What am I doing this for? Does this provide any value to the people that know me? Does it provide value to people who could find this? All those kind of questions you got to. And like I said, at the end of the day, if you want to do YouTube, do it. If you're a Christian, do it for the glory of God. And even if you have to put out drivel, just put something out every week, but do your best. But uh, you know, it's it, it, the consistency is because I, I would have never thought of all the, all the other things that people could watch on YouTube that we would find. 15,000 subscribers and 1,500 to 2,000 people that would want to watch any given video. That's that's interesting. And I wonder, because I subscribe to channels, Braxton, right? And I get notifications. I look at the video and I'm like, no, I'm not going to watch that one. Even though I like the channel, I like the person, it's like... And you'll watch it next time if you do like it, is what you're saying. Or... Or yeah, if if I'll, if the next video comes out, it's like oh that's interesting. I will watch watch that. You know, so I don't know how that works. If you just have a bunch of subscribers that are never watch anything whatsoever, watch every week and watch on occasion. I don't know how that breaks up to when you look at we have fifteen thousand subscribers, two thousand people watch that video. Is that the same people that watch the other one or the other one or do most of these people not watch anything? Do they just forget that they subscribe? Because I see my subscriber list and and I unsubscribe to certain things that I haven't watched in a long time. But it's like, because you always hit, you know, you do that maintenance like you do with Facebook friends. These people, I don't know who you are. You're gone. You say stupid stuff or whatever. Um, so I don't even know how all that works. But it seems to me, I know how I work with YouTube. It if And just because I like you and your channel doesn't mean I'm going to watch everything that you do every week. So Wait, I don't know how didn't works. I put something up there a minute ago that I wanted us to talk about? And it's or, or sometimes what I'll do is, if I have a road trip or something, if I'm driving to a conference or a speaking engagement or whatever, I will go and I will watch the last 10 videos you who, uploaded because I saved them all for that trip. So it, it's a mystery I, to me. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know who asked it, but somebody asked a minute ago about what our thoughts are on whether infant baptism is biblical. And um, I always feel like when somebody asks me if something is biblical, there's like three different ways people mean that. Some people mean, is it consistent with the Bible, as, is, as in isn't unbiblical in the sense that it's against the Bible? So you could talk about Molinism, is it biblical or unbiblical, you know, that kind of thing, right? Um, but I think the, if, if what someone means by is it biblical is, is it taught in the, in the Bible, 
I I don't think so. What about you? There's no occurrence mm-hmm. where it's explicit. Mm-hmm. I understand it's they possible. They want to draw a covenantal distinction between circumcision and baptism, right? Well, I understand their arguments, and I understand that you can say it's implicit or implied when whole households are baptized, for example, or whatever. But I can I can agree with you that it's it's certainly not explicit. I and people say, yeah, but the Trinity is not explicit. Well, I think the Trinity is more explicit than infant baptism. They're both argued from a good necessary consequence of Scripture. That's the justification. What was the example? You get a counterexample. Trinity. So people are going to say, you think infant baptism is more or less explicit? Less. Neither one are explicit right. in the in the God is a Trinity it's, statement. It's further down the implicit line than the Trinity is. You get right. there almost immediately. Yes. When you start and thinking about both it. infant baptism and the Trinity are what is called, as said in the Westminster Confession for these, anything that's not explicitly said in Scripture or a good and necessary consequence of, right? And the, our, our, our paedo-baptist friends are going to say that this is a good and necessary consequence of Scripture given all their theological reasoning about covenantal theology and everything else, right? And 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 the, the changing of the signs from the new... Oh, that's covenant, what I was covenant. talking about. Yeah, right. yeah. that's what they're going to say. I don't think it's... I think that is so less implicit <laughs> than the, the Trinity, right? That I can't... I cannot... Now, and, and I'm not even a sola scriptura guy, you know, I mean, like, I'm like, let's look at some tradition, not all tradition, but let's look at some tradition and see what's there. And when you look at it in the early first five centuries, I mean, Tertullian's like, Pfft, right? So, I mean, some of these ideas very early are like not, there's no consensus around it. So I'm like, even if you're not a, you know, so even a Baptist like me who's not straight sola scriptura and wants to uh, look at some early, you know, the paleo-orthodoxy, consensus of the first five centuries and all that and the council's creed there's nothing i can't get there from there either right mm-hmm. but i am prima script scriptura so scripture on top of tradition right mm-hmm. it's not there in scripture and i'm not even convinced from tradition that i'm we're misreading and misunderstanding how to reason with scripture on this point mm-hmm. so i can't get there from either scripture or tradition so i re- remain unconvinced right. and firmly credo baptist dr hunter what do you think of the idea that under molinism god can reset somebody's memory until they accept christ dr alice Proust raised this objection against molinism well see i was waiting a moment i was laying a trap for you it's a trap i was laying a trap for you i was waiting for you to start talking and i was gonna go pritchett pritchett it says dr hunter but you didn't fall for my trap um I don't know what you're talking about. I'd have to see exactly what you, I'd have to see what you mean. I mean, in a certain sense, in a certain sense, when you have on Molinism, all the possible worlds and the feasible worlds of free creatures there, I mean, that's kind of like resetting it a whole bunch of times. It's like looking at all the worlds where it shakes out differently according to free will. And, um, but it sounds like maybe you're talking about in a given world, like after death, let's say, God could basically restart their memory again and again and again and, and let them play it out until they reach the point where, just according to the numbers, eventually they might accept Christ or something. Um, there's a lot of assumptions, both theological and philosophical. I would want to read that, but um, feel free to link or put the art name of an article or something because that sounds super interesting and right up my alley. All right. Um, we're, it we're, sounds we're like... It sounds for, like um, well, not just resetting people's memories, but resetting the entire cosmos every millisecond. Yeah, even though it's almost like he's trying to use an occasionalist type argument against Molinism, and I, I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know how this gets off the ground. Because, well, and I don't know that he's not a Molinist either. But the yeah. thing is, uh, but, oh, I raise objections to Molinism right. all the time. But I'm just but, trying but, to figure this one out, and I was like, oh. Well, but but see, that's what made me think you must not be talking because if the if the idea is, what if he just. Um, what if he just groundhog days the whole universe over and over and over again? What till everyone freely? Cause then we're just getting back to the same object or to the same things that Molinists are already happy to talk about. Like, well, until everyone um, freely accepts Christ. Well, the Molinists are saying there may no be, be no feasible world where everyone freely accepts Christ. Right. In other words, it, it, it and so, even um, if even if resetting the memory, the groundhog, right, day, right, day, right. the entire human population. Right, right. So I thought what he meant maybe was 
maybe you're resetting, maybe each individual, like you die, Jonathan Pritchett, and you're not a believer, let's say. You die and you're just a horrible, horrible human being. I mean, that's also true not a believer. being a believer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, also yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> I see how you say that. Yeah. Um, but I'm just playing into what I know you'd say about that. Yeah. But, um, and so that's true about you and you die. And now God says, or now, however it's played out, you get another shot. You just after death. Maybe in a simulation. Maybe 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 this happens over and over again in your life for six thousand years, but in reality, it takes only a few moments, right? It doesn't. It's right. no it, problem for God. Science and, fiction. And you have this chance to go through and do all this thing, you know, yeah. like some kind of horrible Black Mirror episode. Right. God right? puts you in that, that, that <laughs> yeah. mind prison that for three thousand years. And yeah. It's only but then at the or Hinduism, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of world religions bring it full circle and then you get and then you get back around and uh and you or you finally do come in one of those worlds given enough time you become a christian you accept it and now here's my problem with that that even if as long as free will is libertarian yeah it could theoretically be possible that no matter how you could there's no amount of times you could reset it that i would be and the fact that i was memory hold right yeah. every time means that i never learned right you don't get the benefit of hell once you once you're in hell and then get memory hold and try again because if that was the truth like if if i could if i know i'm still in the loop because i haven't done x no right? this is a great this is great pause everyone yeah i may have just seen something in the chat that i may be interpreting wrong but i don't think i am and, and it's a great moment for me to talk about a new thing that I've learned or thought more deeply about, and I want to call it out whenever I see it. So um, I, Darren, Plies says, Darren Plies says, story of redemption in a libertarian free world. Now, that might be a libertarian, and he may be referring to a comment that was made 10 minutes ago, and it's beautiful. But what that struck me as, and maybe because of the natural cynicism of working in the online world, is that a Calvinist might say that to mock that we're given all this weird, like uh, you get have over and over again, the chances for thousands of years in a weird black mirror um, type bizarro world where it's a good thing. Type, all, that, all that going on. And it, look how convoluted this is. Look at, look how crazy all this is. They have to do to believe it. And this is a great moment because well, no, it's not at all like that. We're being asked a interesting hypothetical about a way God maybe could have done things and we're answering back with a, with an equally philosophical and speculative response, right? And that doesn't mean that any of that has anything to do with the assertion that Jesus died for the sins of the world and that you can freely accept that or not, yeah. which is a much more basic and simple thing. And this is why I brought this up because Jonathan McClatchy said this last week on the show, and I like this a lot, and I've, and I've thought this, but him saying it really affirmed to me the importance of pointing this out and that is that no it's not that it's hard oh you got to go get a phd to be a to become a christian and understand all the arguments no you don't oh well you, you know you have you have to go through all this oh, you have to believe all this weird stuff about molinism and all that to think that it's feasible for a free will creature to but no you don't it's just that as more and more convoluted and speculative objections come more and more uh, convoluted responses have to be made yeah. And then you can't point at the response that we made to your last thing and say, look how crazy big of a response you just made to the question, is there a God or not? Or why do you believe there's a I'm God? Just, I'm just I waiting, didn't. I'm waiting to see the Darren P. Plies like, yeah, that's not what I meant. I think it's not <laughs> what he meant. It's probably not what he meant, but it gave me an opportunity to go off about it. It was a springboard to, to, to something. Yeah. He's like, I was talking about something else, dude. <laughs> that's what yeah. I did. Well, that kind of stuff happens a lot. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. Here's, here's the thing. Uh, if you watch my Calvinism series, Calvinists, you are correct, make a lot of objections like that, but Calvinism doesn't even get off the ground for me. It's like the least plausible system of the, I mean, I, you know, it's just, uh, it's very interesting. It's, it's, it's like ridiculous. You think you should believe this. That's how, that's where I'm at with that, that whole issue right now. Uh, but but if you want to hear me talk about why that is the case and why Calvinists don't really actually even know a whole lot of anything and what they call exegesis when it comes to these uh, disputes is just laughable, you need to become a patron. Go to, Dang dog. Go to we got Patreon.com slash 
slash Trinity Radio, become a patron and hear me rant about why, why Calvinism is super duper interesting, is a very interesting, uh, important uh, stream of highly contextualized post-medieval, post-Reformation Western theology that that is also kind of ridiculous if they expect you to believe it. Talk a little more for just a second. I yes, want to show y'all something. If you'd also like to learn uh, formally, you can also go to, I'm going to advertise, man. Go to trinitysim.edu, sign up, become a student at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, a seminary education that you can afford taking courses from professors you've actually heard of. Yeah. And he's the president. Yep. And he was also a client, kind of like the hair club, that he's not a president or client of but okay um, uh, he has got uh, he got some degrees from here and then uh, a lesser degree from Luther Rice man what are you talking about no I think uh, I said you've got you were not only the president you were also you were also a student I know, but why did you even why why are we because talking? I believe that every seminary is lesser than Trinity College of the Bible Theological Seminary yeah, well, for the very amen. fact that they amen. don't have you there amen okay or me or Lady Sheesh. Flowers, or Chris uh, Bade, or Chris Feather, the TU, or Tim Stratton, as or he's, Daphne stop Washington, it, stop, or Jim Stop, stop, Chattel. stop, stop. The TU, as they have come, will come, have come to be known here, it says, "Why is your merchandise black and yellow when your channel is a monochrome green and black?" Because he hasn't updated it yet. Actually, boom. Oh, he did today. Oh. Today, and this isn't even all of it. But in fact, there's a T-shirt that has. Well, I'll just show it to you. You'll probably, you guys might not like it. But, um, well, I can't get rid of this now. It just lives here. What is that? A water bottle or shaker? There's a bottle? water bottle. We already had a coffee cup. So, um, our channel colors used to be yellow and black, and, and then I they like were blue, the and now they're this. And I think we've settled into this. But there's something else I want to show you guys real quick. There used to be a little triangle with Trinity Radio too. Way back. And I liked that as well. Way back. We've never had bad like logo stuff. What We've never had is? bad intro what's music. The con- what's the common denominator there? You. I have No, I'm going to brag on Brad. I have always told Braxton well, thank you. I, that I, I think kidding. his aesthetic taste is is the best in the biz. And he thinks that Cameron Bertuzzi oh, is the obviously. best. Oh, obviously. No, no, no. And, I don't, and like, totally not. Totally not. Cameron. Totally not. No, um, Braxton is the best in the bit. Now, he won't make my T-shirt that I asked for that he thinks would, like, sell second to the Sanctimonious Blather T-shirt. But um, but uh, I might, here. I I might make a Trinity Radio Extra merch store. And 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 make that shirt. Uh, this is on t-shirt. Merch. This is on a t-shirt for ladies and a t-shirt for the dudes. And that t-shirt for the dudes might as well be a unisex t-shirt. It says favorite topics. And this is I'm, this is kind of like a summary kind of feel here. Puppies, podcasts, books, Jesus, music, Hebrew, philosophy, epistemology, science, atheism, theology, worldview, kittens, morality, Greek, beauty, Christianity. There's a spatter of things that I think represent the kind of people that enjoy Trinity Radio. Yes, uh, we have a meow, 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 and then you have the I don't ever butcher cats. So, I mean, right, you, right. You, kittens are like your number one go-to for violence. For any sort of violent oh, illustration I, that you come up with always involves cats. It's usually not that violent when I kill cats. I don't kill cats. What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? Greek beauty. Sam says Greek beauty. It did say Greek and beauty. Um, anyway, go check that out. You can check that out at Teespring. I wanted to have some of those new items featured today in the um, merch bar that's below the screen here. But <clears throat> for some reason, it hasn't uploaded and up or uh, so, sorry, updated yet. But you can go buy any of that stuff now. And I think there is a disc uh, account if you use the discount code Brando. Really? Brando. Nice. So try that. Nice. And uh, that'll be fun. I thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. My t-shirt idea was all of the above a phobe. Just to just cut to the, because Christians are racist, sex is big. Praise the Lord, the TU. And I I said, let's have a shirt that just says all of the above a phobe or et cetera (laughs) phobe or just a a blank line phobe. Because I mean, like we were talking about this at church the other day. And it's like, Christians always get called like all the worst things. And I'm just totally like, I don't even care anymore. I'm so impervious. And we just know that, that people who are all those labels are bearing false witness. For the most part, there are certain people who are 
either racist, sexist, bigot. Every or time I look person. away from but you, but I just but but they throw that they throw that out at all of us, right? And so I was like, we need to just an an all of the above a phobe shirt and just wear it proudly. Um, but Braxton said he won't time, make it. Every every time I look away and look at the chat and try to do other things, I, I'm forced now by age to not pay as much attention to you. Which is great because I get to experience the show for a second time later. But the the reality is when I listen, when I look back up, you're always saying something like really provocative. That's just my everyday life when we do this. Yes. You said talk. <laughs> this is what you get. See, but that's why I didn't know that you had already said all that stuff about Jimmy because I had tuned you out too. And I was like, do they know who Jimmy is? I mean, Jimmy's our, our, at our church. He's the awesome guy that everything cool about our church. Jimmy. And you're like, yeah, I already said all that. And I'm like, oh, okay. Jimmy, look, I, I want you to um, notice something. All right, I'm trying, I'm really trying here. Do a million okay. people want to watch this? Do you <laughs> see, do you see I've got the little light halo that goes along my shoulders, differentiating me from my background? Do you see that my head is only a few centimeters from the top of the screen? You see all that? I'm trying. I'm really trying. So look at things as they are right now and tell me what I'm doing wrong later. Okay? All right. This has been awesome. Yes, Pritchett is very jesty and uh, zesty. What did I say? Jesty. He's jesty and zesty. I oh, yeah. am. Um, Pritchett is zesty. Thank you. That's Thank what you. I'm talking about. Yeah. One hey, of these listen. days we're going to get back to our patrons only after show, but I don't think it's not this day, right? Yeah. It's not this day. Is that, what's that sound? It sounds like a sound of victory. Like a great battle has just been won across the waves of the YouTubes. Right, because we basically spent the last 15 minutes promoting stuff and people stayed. <laughs> it's the 15,000 celebration. Yes. Buy our merch. Onward to the next 15,000 for Brando. For and Brando. for our king. Amen. We'll see you next time, folks on in honor of eric on trinity radio